I received an email to the channel with the subject line, Solo Tabletop Dungeon Crawl. And that's the type of subject line that gets me to open an email right away. And the email was from this designer of Dungeoneers, which is a PNP game that I had never heard of that was developed on his own. And he was reaching out to me to let me know about it, not asking for a video on it, but just as um, letting me know that it was something he had worked on and that I might be interested in. And indeed, he was correct. I was and am interested in it, quite interested actually, to the point where as I was playing the game that he eventually did send to me, I had a few email exchanges with the designer with some notes and suggestions about some rules tinkering and mentioning a few things in the rule book that I thought could possibly be improved or clarified or whatever. So that's a little backstory to this video. I don't know the designer, but we have exchanged emails a bunch of times at this point, and I'm very taken with the work that he's done to develop this game on his own. This video is going to take you through a little bit of the the rules and also give a demo of encounters, a combat, and perhaps searching a room tile. This is my party. I've been playing the game with characters that I developed and I'll talk about the I'll talk about these characters and, and how they have evolved over the course of the quests that I've done. They're now level three characters. This is my wizard, this is my alchemist, this is my barbarian, and this is my thief. I made them all humans. There are options for different races in the book. To me, the benefits that I got from the other races were not as great as what the flexibility that the human offered. And that's unusual for me because typically when I play games like this, I, I almost like never have humans as characters. But I have these are all humans and those are their professions. And the way we're going to talk about this in the course of the video, there's just so much to discuss with this book, is the first thing I'm going to do is take you along the journey of my alchemist here, because I have gotten to a place finally where he can start to forage for some materials to make some potions. During the course of the first couple of quests, he has been getting some animal parts from the enemies, the defeated enemies. But in order to make a potion, he needs different types of components and he needs different, he needs a combination of parts that he has. He has a lot of them. And in fact, toward the end, I stopped collecting them because it was just too much. He has a lot of parts, but he also needs some items, some components from nature. And in the next quest that they're doing, they're going to be walking three days outside. And that's going to give him an opportunity to use his alchemy skill to attempt to get some search for some ingredients. When he leveled up, one of the talents that I took, another benefit that you can do when you level up, is I made him a gatherer, and that's going to give him a plus 10 on the alchemy roll when he's searching for ingredients in the wild. The way this works is this is a percentile system. So in this case, he would need he's got a 52 right now on this skill, but he would need to roll 62 or less in order to be successful. So we're going to start just by doing that and sh showing you this particular option and here is the this is the rule book. This is a printed play game, and I'm going to be showing you components. This is a bound book that the designer sent to me. This is, there are also some, quite a few dungeon tiles that are referenced. You can play this without some of the components that I'm showing you and just sort of make your own using graph paper and things like that. But getting back to this, to get right into this here. This is a whole discussion of alchemy, and the we're in the gathering ingredients portion here. So it says that during overland travel on their way to and from a quest, 
the party can try to gather ingredients once per day using the hero with the highest alchemical skill value. And if you get a success, you can roll twice on the ingredients table. Now there, and then there's a list of potions that you can attempt to create. In my play right here, I am playing through the numbered quest campaigns. This is the quest book. This would be a separate book. I have it bound together here, but this is the quest book. And in the quest book, you have six, really seven numbered quests in a campaign, and I'm on number three. And then you have a whole bunch of random quests here. And you also have a traveling events table and encounter tables and the way to generate your rooms. And for the purposes of this video, though I am going to start by showing you uh, my attempt to gather ingredients for potions, because I've really been working hard to, to get to this spot, I'm going to set up a just a demonstration encounter to show off some of the elements of the system. We're not going to be playing through my particular quest. However, my particular quest now is this Highwayman quest, and it tells me that it is located three days southwest of the city. So that means I'm going to be traveling for three days. And what that means in part is that I can do three alchemy rolls to attempt to get some ingredients. So I'm going to be doing that now. And as mentioned, the roll that I'm looking for, it's a 62 or less because I'm searching for ingredients here. There are other things I need to be doing when I am, oh, look, a 60. That's great. There's other things I need to be doing when I am traveling. But for right now, I'm just focusing on getting these ingredients. So that was one success there for one day and two successes, two days and a fail. So basically two of the three days, my alchemist was successful and he's going to now get to roll to see what he possibly found. So here we have the table of ingredients and by my interpretation of the rules, we get to roll four times on it with our two successes. So we will do that and give the note down what we get. So we got a 23, a 24, a 13, and a 32. What we need per the rules here are four components, and it has to be both ingredients and parts, but it could be any mixture of the two. However, what's really cool is that you're actually making a recipe so that what I decide to put together, and I need to note this down, I think there's a place back here. So here's the potion that you're going to make and the recipe for it. I need to look at the parts that I have here combined with what I got. And then it says when you mix your components together, you're going to roll on the potions table in the treasure chapter to see what we have created. So then once we created our once we created our recipe, we would roll on this table here. Actually, that's a d20 roll. Made our recipe, we would do our d20 roll. We rolled an eight, and so we have created a potion of courage. I imagine the immediate questions are going to be, how does it compare to Four Against Darkness, and how does it compare to D100 Dungeon? And the short answer to that question is, it is more complex than Four Against Darkness, even when you factor in the more advanced options of Four Against Darkness. Just mechanically, it's more advanced. It shares with D100 Dungeon the use of percentiles for the for the skills and the attributes that you're rolling with against these percentiles. It shares with Four Against Darkness the fact that at least as the this rule set is written and conceptualized, you are meant to be running four characters. Now, there are ways to run fewer characters, and I think for me personally, I may switch to that because managing four characters with this level of detail gets to be a, a, a bit much. I would say it's closer to complexity of D100 Dungeon. They're very, they're pretty comparable. I would say there are differences in terms of what mechanics have been developed by the designer. So they're not the same system, of course, but 
I would say in terms of weight and complexity, they're pretty, pretty equal. Uh, maybe D100 Dungeon has a little bit more, not so much complexity, but more things that you can do in the world, like with the you, the investments that you make and things like that over the long haul. I can't remember the terminology from that game. It's been a little while, but um, they're, they're fairly similar. If you are a D100 Dungeon fan and that level of option is to your liking, this game is something definitely that you should consider looking at. The combat in this game, I would say, though it can feel a little drawn out at times, gives more options just in terms of strategy and tactics and positioning and things like that. And we'll get a look at that later in the video. It is going to be impossible for me to go through everything that this game has to offer in one video. I don't think it would even be interesting to watch that. But I want to give enough of a sense of some of the things that are offered here so that you can understand how the the encounter that I'm going to demonstrate plays out and also get a sense of the richness of the system. Characters do have basic stats, strength, constitution, dexterity, wisdom, and resolve. And then in addition to that, they can develop various skills that are related to these stats. And when they have that skill, so for example, this is single-handed combat, which is a dexterity skill, their percentage to roll on that is the same as the main basic attribute. So in this case, it's 58 as dexterity. If they don't have that skill, they can still use it, but they're using it at half of the value. So a strength use here for two-handed, if there was a two-handed weapon that this character picked up, the character would be using it at a roll of 12% or less, that is to say half of 36. That's not 12. That would be 18. You get the point. So this is a listing of some of the possible skills, including alchemy and perception. Focus is a skill that can help you cast spells if you're a wizard more effectively than not if you don't use focus. In addition, there are professions. There's You could be a wizard, a rogue, a ranger, a barbarian, a warrior priest, a warrior, an alchemist, or a thief. We already went over who I chose, and everybody has various different benefits and starting money and starting equipment as you would expect. Equipment in this game does not come fresh off the rack. Everything that you find is in some type of a condition and it will continue to take damage over the course of your adventure depending on whether it is used to help you defend yourself for example or not and most of the equipment can take up to six points of damage before it breaks and it can't be repaired. When you find things along the way, you need to roll to see how damaged it actually is. And one of the things that I spend a lot of money on in between quests in town is fixing my equipment that I have to, you're able to do that by paying a certain amount of money. So there's, you're gonna be managing that and finding that not only could it potentially be damaged, but it might not even be available. So you see here, there's an availability number here. And I will say that I omitted this rule because it kind of got frustrating when I wanted to get something and then I rolled and I couldn't get it. But to simulate the fact that not only could it be damaged, but there may not be unlimited supply, there's an avail availability number and you can use that rule to determine whether something actually exists for you to get or not. One of the rules here that came back to really haunt me is this miscast rule, which is that if your wizard is not effective in casting spells, there is an overall party penalty to the morale of the party. And the morale and the uh, some other party stats are tracked separately. And you can see here is an example of my tracking. This is the health of the characters and the party morale here. I erased it because it came back to full morale when we ended our quest. But if the morale ever goes to zero, you basically lose the quest. And there's a list here of things that can both help and raise and lower the morale. So if a character reaches zero wounds, meaning they're knocked out, that has a big effect on morale. Or if a character dies or fails a fear test, and you can see a miscast here, it brings the morale down one. So the 
wizard not being able to cast a spell is going to bring everybody down. You can rest and raise your morale. You can drink some ale and raise your morale by three, although I'll say there's some deleterious effects of doing that as well. The idea of psychology here comes into play because you can, it says that characters also have sanity. And when a wizard, for example, is failing to cast a spell, he loses some sanity for that. And if you get to zero sanity, you contract a condition. My wizard indeed contracted a condition of PTSD, and it is triggered when one of his companions, one of his party members, is reduced to zero hit points, and then it has an impact. There are ways to get rid of these conditions also, but they do carry through from quest to quest unless you get rid of them. There are mechanics here for traveling. As I mentioned, it says many of the quests will take place outside the city, so you have an indication of how many days are passing. You will need rations to account for that. You have the ability to search furniture in a room and to search the room just in general. You also have the ability to rest if there are no monsters in the room within line of sight. You can spend some ration and regain 2d6 hit points. So in that regard, the, the game is generous in potentially allowing you just to continue to regain health. And I think that's one of the benefits to it if you're considering, as I am now, running it not with four characters to cut down a little bit on the length of combat and the management of everything to try. The monsters have lots of different special abilities and we won't have a chance to look at all of them, but we have fire breath, ferocious charge, so this gives extra points of damage during an attack. We have a ghostly howl and we have just bones. We have magic beings and magic casters and poison, of course, regeneration and scurry, which is um, they, these rats don't get locked in. There, is zone, there are zones of control in this game. And we'll talk about that when I show you the demo. The rats don't have to deal with that, so that's very thematic, of course. They can just scurry by. We have wall crawlers. Those are spiders. They can move on walls to pass by the heroes. So the, the monsters do get thematically developed with enough differentiation of their skills to make them feel different, and that is, that's great. There are, of course, rules for lev leveling up, and I mentioned that I'm currently with a level 3 party. They involve a couple things. They involve, as you might expect, some increase to stats, and these are thematic. So, for example, the Barbarian is going to get a strength increase, whereas the Alchemist is going to get a wisdom increase as they move forward. And then they also get perks and talents. And I showed you some of these earlier in the video when I was discussing my characters and how they developed. The perks and talents that they get are going to be related to the type of character that they are. So you could get combat perks or sneaky perks, or there's some common perks and things like that. We'll just take a look at the combat perks here that the barbarian had to choose from. So in this case, for example, my barbarian is not a ranged character. I don't have a ranged ability right now in my party at all beyond the alchemist throwing a potion. But I do, I was able to increase my barbarian's melee attack, and that's the route that I'm taking there. And then there are talents, and the, the talents that the characters have are specific skills that they, that they get. They don't need, once they attain these things, they don't need to make any die roll. It's just, it changes the character, whereas the the perks require them to utilize a point of energy to have that occur. And energy points in this game are hard to come by. So the talent is something that's kind of baked in, whereas the specific perk is something that you have to reach for. Before we actually set off onto the third quest, or I show you how a turn works, there's one thing I want to get back to my party and talk to you about. I have left 
162 gold. What I did between quests, actually, I'm not sure if it's called gold, but I have 162 money left. What I did between quests was I fixed some of my weapons. So I spent some money to fix this long, this magic longsword, which was pretty badly damaged, as well as somebody's, let's see, there, this something else was badly damaged. I spent some money on that and that was a lot of the money that I that I spent. But I do have this, I had started out with 307 and I went down to 162, basically just fixing things. There is a new supplement to this game, which I only just received, and it is a companion supplement, a mercenary companion familiar supplement where you can purchase uh, as a one-off characters to come with you or a familiar. Familiar is too expensive for me. That's going to cost me 500. I don't have that. And I think it's going to be hard, unless I get a lot more money, it's going to be hard to even save that because one does need to make a priority in terms of fixing one's items that may be damaged. But I have, 100 and I have 162 left. And with that, I'm going to try to get a ranged mercenary to come with us. Marla Mortcombe. She is born of noble stand and was raised as would seem appropriate for one of her class, but she became a ranger making her own longbow and trying to track down local game. She's got, she's 150 and I can just afford her. She's slightly better than the generic ranger who was also somebody you could hire for 100, but I'm going to go with her because she has some skills. Basically, I want her for just her ranged ability. Looking at quest three here, Highwaymen, it says that we are relaxing in a city tavern when we overhear some upset person talking about the fact that the roads are not safe these days and basically hiring us to deal with the bandits in exchange for money. And we could get up to 200 or, or we could get 200 money per hero. If we successfully do that, it says the attacks are happening close to the old ruined fort located a few days southwest of the city. That was the three days travel that we talked about earlier. And there's a note here, a curious detail that seems to be reoccurring in all the merchant stories is that when found, all wagons were completely smashed up as if they had been tossed into the air and smashed against the ground. So we might want to bear that in mind no further details are given. We are, the way that you are choosing the tiles is through a deck of just a regular deck of playing cards. You're meant to divide them up into red and black and then choose here six black and six red in this case. These will correspond to various room tiles that are provided in the game the red ones, the hearts and diamonds being actual rooms, and then the spades and clubs being corridors. In the revised rules of the game, I believe it's not going to just say this, but it's actually going to direct you to certain particular cards to place so that you end up drawing tiles that are thematic to the quest. Whereas here, even though we're meant to be in the ruins of an old fort, there's no direction here and we could pull in a tile that ends up looking like a banquet hall or something that doesn't really make sense. So for I'm working with this unrevised rule, but what I am going to do is I've pre-selected the tiles and I'm going to make the corresponding cards for me to draw in so that when we end up with what we're doing, it makes sense. And we're ready to start this quest. The first thing we're going to do, we have our party here. This is my companion. This is my mercenary. We're going to roll the scenario die. The current threat level is three. So we rolled above it, at a, that was a five, which means we increase the threat level by one. And ultimately, if we roll below or at or below the threat level, when we do this scenario die at the beginning of every turn, then we have to roll on a table to see if something is happening. 
first thing we do is we're going to go into the next space and we're going to do that by pulling in one of these cards. I showed you how I set them up. This is a nine of clubs and that's going to correspond to, yes. there are four different openings in this card are each covered by heavy wooden doors. No special rules, deal the cards in three piles, then invert them to that topmost, or I should say, so that the topmost card ends up at the bottom, place each tile by an opening. So in effect, what's happening here is we are coming into the beginning of a dungeon and separating out the cards. I've placed the requisite number of doors, and the first thing we need to do is to roll to see whether this door is trapped and locked, and that is a D6 and a D10 roll. And we rolled threes on both of those. So it is neither trapped nor locked. So we can go right in and open the door. Well, I should say we can open the door. Once we do that, we need to check to see whether there is anyone in this space. By default, there's a 30% chance that there will, we'll have an encounter in a corridor and a 50% chance that we'll have an encounter in a room. These percentages can be changed by the specifics of what's going on in the scenario. But for right now, we are only having a 30% chance of something being in here. We rolled a 61, so nothing is in here. So we can walk in and effectively, I probably should have had my thief here at the door because he has the capacity to, if it had been trapped or locked, he has a better chance of opening it easily than this, certainly than my ranged character and then the barbarian. So given that, we're going to move in here. And I think just for ease of filming, we're going to go in this direction because I can place whatever comes next here easily. So we will move into this room and that's really all we can do in this turn. Unfortunately, we can't search Carter, so it's the next turn, so we're going to roll the scenario die again, and we rolled a two. In this case, what this means is we need to then make a threat roll. There are two tables for that. One is if you're in battle, and the other is if you're not. We're not in battle, so we're going to roll. It's a d20 roll on the threat table for not being in battle. Ooh, we rolled a 20. Subtract minus one on all scenario die roll for the remainder of the quest. Well, that's not great. Um, that comes with a corresponding threat decrease of 10. We're only at a threat level. We can't really go down 10 because this is the very beginning, but we do have to remember that for the rest of the game, we're gonna be at a penalty here. So that, or I should say the rest of the quest, we're gonna be at a penalty here, but that doesn't actually bring in any enemies. So the next thing we're gonna do is double check this door, check this door again to see what it is now we rolled, I, it is neither trapped nor locked per the rules. And we're going to go and see, therefore, what's in the next space. So we're going to signal that as an open door. And we're going to open, and we got a two of hearts. And a two of hearts corresponds to a large storage room. This dark room seems to be some kind of warehouse and is littered with crates, barrels, and sacks. Place four stacks of boxes and two barrels in the room. The stacks can be in each be individually searched, and it has two total doors, meaning that it has the door we came in on and then one other door. So let us set that up. And now we need to see who's in this space. Rolling the d20, we're reminding ourselves that we add 30 to this roll to account for our level. That's a 43. So that's going to be... 1d4 plus 1 bandits with crossbows and daggers, and 1d4 plus 1 bandits with great swords. So we basically have ranged 1d4 of ranged and 1d4 of melee. So, oh, that's good. So we got 1d4. So we have two bandits with crossbows, and we have, let's find another d4. One, oh, we have two bandits with great swords, and they have an armor of two. So I'm going to be using these tokens to symbolize the bandits with the great swords and these to symbolize the bandits with the crossbow and arrow. We're instructed to do a random placement and it's a six by six square. So I'll be rolling 2d6 and then black and red across and down and placing them accordingly. 
we are also instructed not to place them directly opposite our party member or adjacent to our party members. So the next thing that has to happen is we need to determine whether or not we surprise them. And we to do this, we need to roll against the highest dexterity of who's ever in there, which is a 30. And there are rules for we so we're testing our dexterity against the highest dexterity of the enemy and We'll give this a roll and see how successful we are. Ooh, 31. If so, if it says if we roll equal or above their dexterity, we can conduct our actions first. That is, that was a really good roll. Um, so this indicates that essentially we have surprised them. And at this point, everybody has two actions. Everybody in our party has two actions. I do keep track of this by using some tokens like this to indicate who's taken what action because otherwise it gets confusing and for my additional party member uh, my mercenary I'll be, I will be using these tokens again as a review when and if you are wounded to a certain extent you're down to one action but right now everybody is at full health I've reoriented slightly to give you a closer picture of the action we're going to have the barbarian come in and attempt to land a blow on the nearby melee character bandit. I'm doing this for two reasons. One, he's got a pretty good chance of getting a hit. And two, his movement will open up a line of sight for this, this Marla with her bow and arrow to try to get off some shots here without actually spending an action to move. So he's going to move one, two, three. He's got a movement of four, doesn't need it. And we're going to give a roll here. He's going to have a hit on a 60 or less. He definitely does make his hit with his great axe. He reaches up his great axe and he does 1d12 plus 4 damage. So this is, this can, this bandit has, let's see, an armor of 1. No, excuse me, an armor of 2. One point I forgot to mention. The, um, I said that, our barbarian has a combat strength of 60. That is okay. Well, as you can see, we had some technical difficulties there. I need to get a new tripod. In any case, what I was saying is that the barbarian does have a combat strength of 60. However, the way this game works is that there's a two hit value. And in the case of the bandits, it's a minus five, meaning it kind of simulates the difficulty level to hit the enemy and as opposed to having the enemy do like a dodge roll or something like that, which our party can do as you'll see later. So indeed he wasn't rolling against the 60, he was rolling against the 55, but nevertheless, he, he rolled a 34. So it doesn't matter, but I just want to clarify that so that when you are figuring out the value against which you're rolling for success, you have to take into account any modifiers from the enemy itself. Be that as it may, he's got a 1d12 plus 4 damage potential with this great axe that he has, and he rolled a 7. So that's an 11. However, there is a 2 armor, so that was landing 9 wounds if my math is correct and it often is not so i'm going to be keeping track of i've got a little notes here this is marla and these are our the four bandits so we will say that this is bandit number one no excuse me that would be bandit number three that he's attacking here and that was down that was a minus nine health points so right away this bandit is down to three hp I do have some options here. So I can have my, my thief has a long sword and that does 1d10 plus two. This has down to three HP. I could just have him come in and attempt and hopefully be successful at an attack here. He would be rolling with the two hit value. He would have a 53% chance of that success. Or I could have the Marla try to get off two shots. She's doing 1d10 plus uh, just 1d10 damage here. I don't know, it's risky. I would like to, I would like to accomplish taking out a character. The safe, safer way, I think, is to go move in with my thief right now and then see what happens. I think I'm going to do that. So the thief is going to come in here 
and attempt to finish off this one bandit with his three health left with his long sword and he as mentioned needs to get he's got a 53 percent chance of doing that that was a fail so the thief has acted twice now i'm using i will be using these blocks to keep track of who's done what and i know that they're i've indicated their color down on the the sheet so the thief He's, so now we're vulnerable here. We're both vulnerable. We never took action to a, do a defensive stance, which we could have done with uh, one of our actions, but it, you know, it was a risk. It didn't pay off. Marla's going to, Marla's going to try to take a shot here with her long bow or her bow and her ranged ability is 50. So with the two hit value also of the minus five, she needs 45. So her first action is going to be to just draw back and indeed she is going to take a shot. It's going to be successful. She only has 10 arrows. So I do need to keep track of that. Her, so she, now she's down to nine arrows and she's going to get a hit on this archer. And this archer is only, does only have one armor. So let's hope that Marla's 1d10 damage is going to be something worthwhile. It really wasn't, but nevertheless, we did two points of damage to, we will call this crossbower number one. So he's down to 10 health. She has one more action to do, and she's going to do the same thing. So this is her first action. And for her second action, same deal. She's going to get a hit and let's hope for more damage from her. We'll see what she gets here Ugh, two so that was one point of damage so that was a pretty pretty poor rolling so that is down to nine health and marla is done for her turn not having moved anywhere we are left with the alchemist and the wizard and the wizard he does have options here. So the options for the wizard, he could attempt, again, without moving and using an action for that, he could attempt his, essentially his fireball. He has a flare that he can toss and he's got line of sight and it's within range. So to do that, I think that is what we're going to do. How does this work? Well, magic works in slightly different ways. There's what's called the casting level for a spell. And you must take the casting level number, in which case this is eight, and subtract it from your skill level, which is in this case a 60. So, in, and that's the number you're rolling against. So in this case, he's got a roll, he's got a 52% chance of success with this spell. And it's going to do 1d10 plus his magic level of damage. His magic level is three. So there is a lot of potential there. I've noted here some spells take one action to do. This is Q for quick and some spells take two. This is a quick spell so he can simply cast it. Now I did mention I believe earlier in the video that the way this game is constructed if the wizard fails, if the wizard miscasts a spell, it kind of affects the morale of the party. This isn't really so dangerous for us right now, but it is something to note down. So I think he's going to do that. He also has a special talent that he got, which is that his magic missile spells do plus one of damage. So he is actually going to do even more damage if it if he gets a hit on that. So it's certainly worth trying, and he's going to just Give it a roll and see if he can roll here at a, what did I say, 52 for success. That was a fail and I think he will try again. Why not? Why not? And he gets a success. So his second, his second magic missile is going to be tossed through the air and is going to hit. And I mentioned the damage is 1d10 plus ultimately it's going to be plus 4 here. So maybe with a good roll, we can just take this guy out. I don't know. We've been rolling very bad. <laughs> the, the bad rolls continue. So we've got three plus four is seven. This guy has an armor of one. So we did six damage to this fellow. The alchemist's real attack value here is in potions in terms of anything that could be distance, but the potions that we have are not 
going to be of use in this cure disease, a disorientation um, potion. We do have this acidic bomb, but these are one-time use things, and I don't I don't see the need here. I'm going to have the alchemist come in here. One, two, three, and assume a defensive stance. And why am I doing that? And what does that mean? I have these tokens here that I'm going to use to symbolize that he has taken, he's taken parry stance or defensive stance. Why did I do that? Well, the, every character has an opportunity to dodge potential incoming wounds from an enemy. However, if you have used one of your actions to take the defensive stance, when you roll that dodge, you get a 20% bonus. So it really increases your chance of defending. The reason that I brought him over here is that per the rules, the enemy is going to attack randomly anyone who is adjacent. So I wanted to basically decrease the chance that he would attack the barbarian or the thief, neither of whom assumed a defensive stance and possibly attack the alchemist who would have a better chance of dodging the blow. That's really the strategy there. Additionally, it brings the alchemist in contact with this uh, long swordsman number two, who is definitely going to attack him because he's the only one in range. And again, he will have a better chance of defeating it. Whereas if he wasn't here, the AI probably would have had this enemy move to somebody nearby, one of these two who were not in defensive stance. So that was my plan there because I felt that he really wasn't really, he wasn't going to be able to take someone out on his own. And if he used his one action to move and his section, second action to attack, he too would not be able to get any benefit of a defensive stance. So but that, everybody's done their two actions and now it's going to be the enemy turn to attack. And that is where we will go to the enemy AI rules. We've got the humanoids with hand weapons, which are these two bandits, and then we have the humanoids with missile weapons, which is this one remaining bandit here. So we're going to start out by looking here, and this we can see what I was talking about here because it says if more than M spaces away, M being their movement value from a hero, they're going to move toward the closest hero. So had the alchemist not been here, the AI would have dictated that this character moved to attack one of these two. I think you get that point. If they are within M spaces of the hero, we're rolling a D, 1d6, and then we're following these rules. And let's see, um, but they are adjacent. So we're going to make room for more enemies, not relevant. If adjacent attack, according to the table, they will always avoid traps and can climb obstacles to attack enemies. So well, we could see that they could go on top of the stack of boxes, for example, and then attack from above. And this may be a relevance here with this enemy because that could give a potential bonus. But we'll we'll get to that when we get to that. Let's let's uh, finish up here with the this bandit attacking. We're going to roll a d6 to see what type of attack occurs to start with, and that was a one. So a one to four is a he's going to assume a parry stance. So he's, his first action is he's going to go defensive and I'll need to get a token for that. All right. He's gone defensive. And then second action is going to be a four. That's going to be a standard attack. And it's going to be randomized as to who it, who is attacked. And as I said, that's going to be what I, my hope is that it will land on the alchemist in a way. This is going to be a, I'm going to do a D3 roll, one, two, three, one, two, three, to see who's going to get attacked. <laughs> the alchemist got attacked by the D3. It's two. So the thief is going to be attacked by this character. Now, one thing to note, once somebody begins to attack a particular character, they will remain through the course of combat attacking that character until you know they're dead or that character is dead so you sort of have to remember that it can get a little it can get a little challenging when there's more going on even than there is here but so this um this great swordsman who is going to be attacking the thief now and he has a combat strength of 
50. And there's no modifier here because we do get to attempt to dodge out of the way. So, so let's see what he's going to roll, or whether he's going to be successful. And he is. That's a 23. So he gets off a he gets off a slash with his sword, and that is going to do. So that could be 2d6 damage. So we're going to see what potential damage that is here. That's going to be a seven. And we need to roll to see where that hits. And that per the rules that hits on the torso. So he stabs the thief in the torso and the thief, let's see, let's see, I think, yes, he's got, so that is potentially seven damage to the torso. We do have a leather jacket, and you can see that the leather jacket offers a three defense on the torso. So we can take that off the um, the seven to be potentially four damage to the thief, and we will also then have to indicate that this leather jacket was damaged. However, the thief can attempt to dodge out of the way of that. Everybody can attempt to dodge a an attack and. It, well, I shouldn't say that actually, but in most cases you can do attempt to dodge. He has the dodge skill at 58. So let's see, before we indicate whether or not he even got this damage, let's see, can he get out of the way of that damage? And he did. So he jumped out of the way and the actions of this long swordsman are over now. He's done both his actions. We Again, this parry stance that he's taken is going to make it harder for us to attack him next turn, but we're still we're still dealing with them attacking us. And now we move to this great swordsman who is going to, per the rules, just focus his attack on the alchemist because that is the character to whom he is adjacent. But we still need to do the d6 roll to see what type of attack. And we do a four. So whoops. We do a four, so that's going to be a standard attack. Standard attack means he can do this twice because he hasn't moved yet. So he's also going to be rolling to see if his sword can land, and that's going to be at a 50. And that's a miss. So his first attack is a miss. He's going to go, go again one more time, and he missed. So he missed twice. He's done. And now we have the remaining character here. This is the ranged character. So he's going to follow, um, he's a humanoid with missile weapons, and he will follow this sequence to see what he does. If within two spaces of a hero, he's not. So he's not going to move away. He can move up to M spaces to get into a position that increases his odds to hit, including climbing objects. Well, he is going to do that because he is behind this stack of boxes. So he's going to use one action to climb up here and that is going to give a benefit. I think it's a 10% benefit. I'll have to check to his ultimate attack. And then to see who he targets, it's either going to be the closest enemy, which would be this alchemist again, or the easiest to hit. Now the question is, in fact, you know, I'm not sure this alchemist is in line of sight. Well, he's standing on the boxes, so I'm going to say he can shoot over these I'm going to say he could shoot over these boxes to the alchemist. That's a question. I have uh, the boxes are of equal height, but he's standing on them. So I'm going to say I'm going to say that is within line of sight. So let's do let's give a roll then to see like who he is going to target. It's going to be two. So he's going to target the closest enemy, which is going to be this alchemist here. Now he only has one action left because he did use one to climb up there. So he is going to then take his, well, we're going to see what he's going to do, actually, because he might take aim six. No, he's going to shoot. So he's going to shoot at the alchemist. He's going to draw back his bow and shoot. And let me confirm the benefit he gets to climbing. And we're going to take a look here on the rules. A character attacking from above will do so at plus 10 CS or RS. That's the ranged um, stat that he's going to be using. This symbolizes the better overview you get of the situation. So he his ranged attack, his ranged strength is 35. So he's going to be getting a 10% bonus. So he's going to be 
at a 45 or under, he's going to land a hit on our, or, you know, land a hit. And yes, he did. The alchemist potentially can get out of the way. The crossbow is a 1d10 plus 3 damage here. And let's see, first of all, if the alchemist can just jump out of the way of this. Remember, he had taken the defensive stance, which is going to give him the plus 20 benefit to his dodge. And his dodge is... His dodge is 42, so that's going to be a 62. He's going to dodge out of the way, and ooh, not only does he dodge out of the way, he really dodges out of the way. He rolls a three. Now, I believe there is a new rule in this game. At least it's a rule I've been playing with, and it may be a rule in the updated rules, which is that if you're rolling on a skill and you roll 10 or below, well, at least this is how I've been playing, you get to increase your, not only do you succeed, but as a little extra reward, you get to increase your stat by one point. So in this case, following these rules, I'm going to be able to bring up my dexterity from 42 to 43, and that is going to help my related skills here, which are uh, most of the skills I actively use. So not only did I dodge out of the way, and I don't even need to roll for the damage, but I help myself out. And I suppose we're going to roll to see if we are going for uh, Marla or the wizard. So we'll say odd even for Marla and the wizard. And so we are going to go for the wizard here and we're going to roll and see what type of attack we do, which is going to be, we're going to aim and then we're going to shoot. So aiming is going to give us a, it's going to cost an action and it's going to increase our chance to hit by 10%. So for our second action, our, we're going to draw back this crossbow that is going to draw back instead of dealing with a 35% chance to hit, he's going to get, whoops, he's going to get a 45% uh, chance to hit and he misses. So that is now both the actions of this crossbowman. And now we've got a scenario here with this crossbowman has three health left, and this great swordsman, who is in defensive stance now, has three health left. Because he has taken a defensive stance, it's going to be a minus 10 modifier to our attempt to, in addition to the minus five modifier that he already has, to our attempts at him. So, so our Rarian, again, our Rarian with, our, with the great axe, he's got a strength value of... 60. His two-handed strength value is 60, but we need to take off 10% of that because this this fellow has, this bandit has taken a defensive stance, so that's bringing us down to 50, and then he already has the two-hit modifier of minus five, which I think is cumulative, so we're down to 45 for our barbarian, but I think that's our best, our best shot right now, so we're going to Give it a give it a roll, and he does land a hit. That's great. And what hit does he land? He's rolling a one d twelve plus four. So let's see. We've just been rolling so badly here. Actually, what I want to do, I want to clean this up. And so our barbarian's taken one one action, and let's see what he can do. And great, he can get rid of this this fellow who had been down to three health to start with. So we've eliminated this guy. Now, when you eliminate someone, you're going to put a token there to indicate that you can loot the body. And I'm going to use this backpack token to indicate that later on, when there's no enemies around, we can go back and loot who loot this body. And we sort of also have to remember who it is because the treasure table that we're going to get to roll on will differ depending on the enemy that was there. So maybe we'll leave this token here. I think it will probably be clear. In any case, the barbarian has only taken one action. So at this point, he has options. He probably will assume um, a defensive stance. He'll probably... I think that's probably what he'll do, just to be, just to be extra safe. So we'll give him 
this token to indicate that and indicate that he has taken his second action. Now, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to have Marla act. And I indicated, if you've been watching the video straight through, you'll notice that when she took her actions last turn, I made a mistake and forgot that she gets this hunter's eye perk. What this means is that every time she draws back and shoots, she can actually send out two arrows. She has to roll separately for the damage, but she could potentially do four arrows worth of damage here. So I want to see if she can eliminate this crossbowman who only is only does now have three health left. So for Marla's first action, she is going to draw back and see if she can get a hit. She is rolling for this at a 35, her range stat is 35. And so she, oh, she just misses there. That was her first action. She's going to try again and see if she can target this guy. Oh man, she rolled a 38 twice. That's terrible. All right, she missed twice. So she got a mark up. She used up two arrows doing that. And she's now down to seven arrows. All right, the wizard, I think, is going to attempt a another flare at his chance of doing that is going to be 52%. So he did got off a flare. That was his uh, first action. And let's see, what type of damage is this going to do? It's going to do a 1d10 plus 3 damage. So that's going to do 6. So that's going to take out this. So we'll replace him with this token to be looted later. And that was only the first action of the wizard who still hasn't even entered the room yet. Because this guy is standing here, I don't think the wizard can come in and hide behind the barrel because he could, that would be the only other thing I would want to do with him right now. So I'm going to, I'm not going to do that for his second action. I'm going to have him take a defensive stance. I should have removed this. So he's going to take a defensive stance now for his second action. So he's done. And we're left with the alchemist and the thief. And the alchemist is going to attack. This is a at full health. This bandit is at full health. And we're going to have the alchemist, who is Horatio the alchemist. He is going to use, attempt to use his longsword to attack and he's going to be rolling at a 43 on that and or less and that's a fail and I think for his second action he's also going to assume a defensive stance again and just be conservative here. So he's done his two actions and last we have the thief and the thief cannot, he's got to move to attack here, leaving himself exposed. But I think that's what he is going to do, shelter getting anybody out of line of sight. So he's going to be putting himself in harm's way no matter what, one, two. So we might as well just move him over here. Three, he's sort of standing in the doorway here. And for his second action, he is going to attempt. So Steely the Thief is going to, uh, with his longsword, he is going to attempt an attack, and he's going to be having 58% chance of that. That is great. He landed that attack, and it is going to do 1d10 plus 2 damage. <laughs> it's rolling is just awful. So he landed 3 points of damage on this great swordsman. All right, I'm going to try to speed this up a little bit. The great swordsman here is going to attack the, the continue to attack the alchemist. And first we're going to see what type of attack he does. That is going to be a, he's going to assume a parry stance for the next time. So actually we should be um, giving him that. And then he will, his really only other option with one action is he's going to then do a standard attack. So that's going to be at a 50% chance of a hit. 
here, and he did a miss. He rolled an 81. That was a miss. So those are his two actions, but next time he's going to be harder to hit. And the long swords or the crossbowman who's left here is going to continue to do his attack at the wizard and the crossbowman back here is going to that's a five so he's going to use a skill or special talent which i don't think he has so he's just going to do a regular attack so his first attack we will be uh, whoops that's going to be a a hit and we'll see if the wizard in his defensive mode can dodge that and that is going to be at a so he's got a 38 percent chance of dodging that and oh he does so that was the first one and then the second attempt at the the second shot from the great bowman is that's going to be a miss i do think this is a fair indication of i mentioned earlier in the video where the combat can get a little bit drawn out because of the number of enemies but also because you're you're constantly able to take this potentially to dodge the damage that's incoming um, in any event let's have marla do her let's have marla attempt so her first shot that is going to be that's going to be a success and, and now i'm going to remember that she has this hunter's eye so I can roll separately for the the damage. Each arrow is going to do one d10, two d10s to see what the damage is. Ooh, there we go. Now we're talking. All right. So she did ten. She did twelve damage with two arrows. So let me. So seven, six, five. She's down to five arrows. That was a total of twelve points of damage on this fellow. And he has an armor of one. He's still hanging on because he was... Let's just see if the wizard can take care of this guy with a flare and a 52. And that's a miss. He's going to attempt again. So his second action is going to be um, a second action. There we go. That's a hit. And his... Well, with one point, I don't even need to roll for it because he's going to automatically do, just based on his level, at least three points of damage. So this... Um, is finally gone off of the and now we are left with we're down to one finally and we are left with this great swordsman who's hanging on he's got 11 health and i think our barbarian is well let's see what the thief can do here thief standing right there with the long sword so he's gonna roll and that's a that's a fail and second action that's a hit or potentially a hit and the damage done is going to be 1d10 plus 2 finally so we're getting some good rolls at least at the end here 9 10 11 we're down to two health here the thief has acted twice and it's our alchemist so hopefully we can just pile this on now our alchemist is going to be acting at a minus 10 for this. So that's a 30. That's a miss. He's going to try one more time. Two misses off the from the alchemist. And then it's down to the barbarian who's going to step over this body and attempt with his great axe rolling he's got a 50 percent chance for this that's that is not a roll he's got a 50 percent chance for this and yes he does succeed even though this guy was in defensive stance and he's going to be doing 1d12 plus four damage which is actually going to just take care of it no matter what so at long last we have eliminated these bandits and we can see what they have been so valiantly guarding. Defeated enemies give you a couple things. In this case, they're going to give us 90 XP for each. So that's 90 times four. And we're going to get four rolls on the treasure one loot table. That's not such a great table, but we'll do that just to kind of tie up, tie up the pieces here. And then we can also, we were instructed, we can search the, some of the contents of the room. So 
We'll quickly do that, and then I'm going to get to my final thoughts on this game. Here we go. Treasure found on defeated enemies. We're, we just get to roll 4d10, basically, on here. And as you can see, there's not it's not so great, but we'll do it and see what we get there. Grab some 4d10. Well, I'll just do 2 and 2. So we rolled an 8 and a 9, and an 8 and a 6. So 8 and a 9, 8 and a 6 zero, nothing but scrap. <laughs> this has happened to me before. And I will say, I think a 50% chance of nothing is kind of high, but be that as it may, we didn't find anything. So we looted the bodies and we got nothing. Per the room rules, we can do a couple things. We can do a room search when there's no enemies in line of sight. You can do a, see if you find anything uh, do, to do a search of the room. And to do a search of the room, I think that actually requires a perception roll. So it says here we do need to do a perception roll for the hero with the highest chance of success. It does require one complete turn. And the significance of that is that after you do the search, you have to roll the scenario die again. And if you get a one or a two in this case, then something would happen. We'd have to roll, go back to that table where you roll. But since at this point we're just, you know, just trying to see if we find anything, I'll show you. So the perception roll, I think the character with the most perception is going to be, understandably, Astronomo, our wizard. So he's got a, a 60 on his perception. So let's see, would we be able to search the room? Ooh, he rolled, he rolled a two. So again, this per the rules that I'm using, this is going to allow us to give a plus one to the wizard's wisdom because that was the, the stat in use here when he rolled the one. So that's awesome and that, that's actually gonna help a lot. So I will take care of that, but successfully able to search the room. So then we go to the treasure found in rooms table. It's a 1d10. And let's just see what we find here. We rolled a one. Oh, a secret door leading to a small treasure chamber. Place room nine of hearts as described in the quest book. So this would lead us to another room and we would enter that and follow those rules, which I will leave you to discover on your own if you play this game. And then there is in here, we were told per the room description that we were are going to be able to search I believe it is the stacks of boxes that we are able to search here. The stacks can each be individually searched. So that's four stacks of boxes. And the, the way the searches work for the rooms is slightly different. There are specific tables. They're a little short, but there's, here are the boxes. So again, it is a D10 roll and we get to do it four times. So the first two rolls, the first two boxes, we got an eight and a one. And the one is going to give one mundane treasure and five and a six, nothing. So out of all that, we got one mundane treasure. And then let's see what this would be. This is going to be a D100 roll. And we will see one of the stacks has mundane 65. It has, it has a ring worth 40 money. So out of that, we got a ring worth 40 money. And we did find the secret room. And so that would lead us lead us on their way were we to continue. However, clearly I'm out of time here and I want to offer some thoughts about this game. I, well, first of all, the fact that a designer did this pretty much looks like pretty much on his own. He's got some special thanks to some of the places where he got the scenery and the pictures here. He thanks one person for his feedback. Um, on this version. I don't know if that means he was like totally working on his own or what it seems that way. Um, it's really a, just a phenomenal output of material with rules that are, for the most part, I think the rules are very clear. Organizationally, the rule book I think needs significant work and there's a lot of flipping around. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I did offer the designer a few thoughts on that. There were, you know, I, there were a lot more thoughts I could have given, but it's um, offers 
more depth than Four Against Darkness, from, from my perspective, obviously, from my perspective, more depth than Four Against Darkness, but still the capacity to manage four characters. And it offers, I think, a level of complexity similar to D100 Dungeon, although the aspects of it that are complex differ. So as you can see, the combat, it's combat centric and a lot of time is spent on the combat. At times it could get a little draggy, I think, because of the ability to dodge every incoming. And if you, you do, could get into a situation where you keep dodging incoming and it goes back and forth a lot. But the level of interaction with the environment, the fact that there are things in rooms that you can hide behind, that you can stand on, that some of the monsters like the spider can climb the wall and do an attack that way, it gives a three-dimensionality that is welcome to this kind of gameplay. I said at the outset, but I'll say it again, you can play this without all these tiles. And I do want to show you, the designer was extremely kind in sending me some, or all, I think, of the tiles that come with the game as actual physical objects. And I do want to show you some of them because they are, they're really great in terms of being differentiated and, and they have obviously their own descriptions and go with various quests, some more tiles, an exterior, a fountain. The ability also of the game to take you outside and to have encounters and events happening in the wilderness and there's a town and fixing up your weapons and things of that nature is also, I think, adds a level of richness to the game that I enjoy and there may be more coming in terms of things to do outside of a dungeon space. I highly recommend this game if you are interested in a I, I hesitate to call it pen and paper. It is pen and paper. It can be pen and paper. You can get the file that has these printed in it and either cut it out and print it up yourself as he has done here, or you could simply get a graph paper and draw these things on the graph paper and place. You don't even need to use minis. I tried to find minis for the sake of the video, but obviously you could just use anything. You could even use simply the cubes. This was my alchemist and this was my thief and do it that way and and come up with something for the enemy so it has flexibility along those lines based on what you happen to have in your game closet or what you happen to be choosing a great addition that is with the companions section is the fact that there are some pre-made generic thief characters or wizard characters or whatever. So you can jump in without necessarily building a character if you want to play that way. I would like to see some rules for, say, jumping in with a level three character or a level five character, how you could do that. That would be, I think, something nice if you don't want to spend the time on the early quests. The early quests in this game are maybe familiar to you if you play these kinds of games where you're dealing with a lot of low-level vermin and essence and things like that too gain some skills to level up and to get the experience of how the mechanics of the game work before you get into the more complicated quests. I haven't played any of the random quests yet, but I'm looking forward to doing that. The one thing that I did, I said this at the beginning of the video, I ended up with four humans as my party because I felt like the options for the different types of races in the game didn't really, it seemed biased in favor of the humans in terms of offering the benefits and I rarely I rarely choose humans so for whatever reason I I wasn't feeling the elves and the dwarfs as offering too much they did have they do have various racial traits but I think I have to go take a look or look at that again and see why I, it just didn't really seem to me worthwhile giving up the option of the customization that the humans allowed where you could just choose for um, something that you wanted to do. But that's that was a minor detail, and in the end, it didn't really matter. I, f I am feeling like my characters are developing along different lines in terms of their profession, so that my barbarian does feel different to me than my wizard. Now, 
the alchemist, I'll say, with the potions that I ended up with, wasn't really useful in these types of scenarios that I would I was expecting. And in fact, I even chose this mini of like throwing a fireball potion or something. Um, I was expecting to use the alchemist's potions much more than I did. I'm not actually even sure that I used one at all now that I think about it in terms of what I've played thus far. So that is a look inside Dungeoneers. It is, in my opinion, an incredibly successful, lovingly designed, well done dungeon crawl that has combat options, decisions to make about things to do outside of the quests in terms of fixing fixing things or buying things or hiring mercenaries and leveling up with choices to make that are thematic to the profession of your character, but also make you think about what direction you're going to move in with developing your character skills and are you going to narrow your focus and try to become like one kind of fighter or are you going to potentially go in a couple of different directions with a couple of different types of weapons and be more of a generalist. Overall, I was incredibly impressed. I am incredibly impressed with the the depth, the effort, and the overall connectivity of the pieces of this game. And I think with some modifications to the layout of the rules, it would be a lot smoother to play but if you read through the rule set, and as you, as you saw, I did a lot of post-it notes to just remind me where various things were, the flipping back and forth can be mitigated in any event. So this was a big success for me, and um, I thank the designer for reaching out, and I hope if this video was of interest to you that you'll seek out this game.